My name is Heather Miller. I'm a PhD student at EPFL. Uh, I work with uh, Martin Oderski uh, on a bunch of scholar-related projects. Um, I know a lot of you from lots of different things, I mean, documentation and otherwise. Um, so it's nice to see lots of you. Uh, for those of you I've never met before, hope to meet you. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, uh, Scala's type system a little bit, talk about some things that seem to be sort of buzzwords in this world. Um, the, 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 the talk, it, it's, it's pretty ambitious. Uh, I had you know, promised I would talk a little bit about the type system in general. I talk about uh, things like type level programming and type classes, things that people like to talk about and use, maybe that everybody <coughs> doesn't understand them. Uh, and then also I mentioned dependent types because, well, in academia, this has been sort of research for about 20 years or so. Uh, it's what lots of people are doing in type systems and suddenly in the last few years, people are using them you know, in, in developer land and people like Miles Sabin have uh, libraries which do stuff with dependent types. Uh, and I don't think people really understand what this stuff is or what it means. So um, I wanted to sort of give people some, some sort of clarification or you know, some sort of high level picture of what all this stuff is and how it, how it fits together. So um, originally my idea was, well, uh, a lot of people talk about these things in Scala's type system and that it's so powerful and wonderful. Um, and in, I think a lot of the time people think it's like this scary thing as well because it's difficult to define, it can do so many things, it's so complicated. Nobody knows really like how to, to, to approach it. And I, I wanna change that, I want to, to, to give you a, a happier, nicer picture of, of what the, the type system can do for you or what it is really. It's something that's kind of auto magical that can help you keep things sort of tidy and super type safe and protected. Um, and I, I hope to say that it can be helpful if you know how to use it. That's my goal kind of in this whole presentation. Um, or Josh, actually, I, I realize that this is a good analogy too, because it's like, you know, uh, well, probably helpful, probably intelligent, and I'm sure that's probably protective. So this is probably like down my new, um, like, you know, uh, mascot for the type system, I think. But anyway, uh, so if you're one of these people who like types a lot and like type level programming and are into type systems, this talk probably is not exactly for you because I want to just give a lot of high level intuitions and sort of like stitch stuff together to tell you how sort of things are related that you might have heard of. Uh, so I think that everybody can get a little bit out of the talk though. And like I said, my aim is intuition for how, how basically to give people more than just the Scala's type system is powerful to sort of show you exactly what I think that means. So um, I, I broke this talk into three chunks. I'm gonna just kind of run through the type system a little bit. So if I start using some words, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm gonna talk about sort of some of the powerful patterns uh, that, that the type system and other things like implicit conversions and whatnot enable. Uh, and then I'm going to go into the world of like sci-fi and talk about dependent types a little bit, what they are. Um, so yeah, first let's talk about uh, Scala's type system. And like I said, whirlwind Toro, and I'm gonna uh, skip several things that, I mean, I just, I mean, if you, if you actually know the, 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 no, the number of, of sort of constructs in Scala's type system, it would be ridiculous for someone to try and cover them all in 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, insufficient, insufficient detail. Uh, and what you can't see down here is infix types and self types. Like, I just don't have time to talk about them. Uh, but what I will cover, um, basically to tell you what Scala's predefined types are, how to define your own types, talk about uh, you know, what it means to have a parameterized or a generic type, variance and bounds, uh, and then actually the cool things um, which are abstract type members, you'll find at the very end of this talk are super ridiculously powerful. Um, existential types, which meh, aren't that powerful, <laughs> as you'll find. Uh, I'll just you know, show you some higher kind of types and, 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 and structural types and refinement types. Um, so the obligatory, I have to show this if, if I'm gonna talk about Scala's type system. Everything is a subclass of any, <laughs> and everything is a super, uh, is a, is a and, and, sorry, nothing, which you can't see, uh, is, is a subclass of everything as well, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, nothing, that's good actually. Uh, I don't know, the slide, the thing seems to be poorly fit for the screen. Anyway, um, and the hierarchy is broken into two pieces. One side has all of the, the value-like things. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, on the left side, everything that, that extends from any val, which itself extends from any, these are all value types. These are all things like primitives, or things we like to think of kind of as primitives, like Scala's unit type, which is like void. 
Uh, and then you have everything else on the other side. And this is the Scala universe. Your program lives somewhere in the middle of all of this. So these things are given to you. Then you can make your own types. How do you do that? Well, you declare a, a trait or, or you know, things. You have uh, you, you you define a you declare you have a, a through class declarations or trait declarations, uh, or you can you can create a type by defining one using this type keyword that you might have seen and make a type member. Those are the two main ways to to sort of you know sum up types from nowhere. Another way to make a type is by combining other types. So you can uh, make a compound type or a refined type, a refined type, which is compound type is basically the union of two types, and a refined type is sort of you know fudging a type that already exists, and I'll show you that later. So these are the ways you can make types. Um, parameterized types. So type parameterization uh, is basically generics. It allows you to write things that are fully generic, like classes and traits and other things like that, um, and. Uh, uh, <laughs> so the, the, point did, the points that I wanted to make here are that you can uh, basically add constraints to these things. You can use uh, this notion of variance or this notion of bounds to, to, to put, to, to control sort of what, what can be passed into a, a, a class or, or, or what a, a type constructor in a class will take, can take. So you might not want, you know, well, I'll give you an example. But uh, to, start, to start with with one of these things, variants, I'm sure lots of you have, have, have heard of this before. Uh, the idea is that if you have uh, something, like a trait box that's totally generic, a class tool, and a class hammer that extends tool, uh, we, don't know we know that hammer extends tool, uh, but we don't know uh, if I have a box of tools, if that is also a box of hammers or what, what relationship they have. And this is what variance does. It basically says, well, on the, on the very left here, covariance is sort of the same as, is, is sort of the forward direction like you would think. Uh, if, if, ha if hammer is a subclass of tool, then a box of tools, I'm sorry, a box of hammers is a subclass of a box of tools. Um, contravariance is the opposite. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, as you can see. And then finally, there's, there's invariance. Uh, and that's, that's when there's, uh, there's no relationship at all. And that's, that's the default in Scala. So if you ever wanted to, if you just assumed covariance, you'd have to add a type parameter, or you have to add a, an, an, a variance annotation to your type parameter, this little plus symbol. Um, because by default, it, the, the, the Scala compiler assumes there's no relationship between a box of tool and a box of hammer. So you can control some things that you do with, your, with, you know, with, with these things called variance uh, annotations. And uh, then you have this other thing called these other things called bounds, which you can actually put all over the place, uh, on uh, you know, uh, on type members and, and, and whatnot. Uh, in in the, the uh, you can you can put a bound on a type parameter inside of a like with this generic thing here, and basically um, you have upper and lower bounds in this trait uh, box here. You, you basically say that you'll take any type t that is uh, tool or one of its that is, is, is bounded by, by tool. So you can take, yeah. Uh, and, then, and then the other way around for, for, for the upper bounds. So you, you'll, you know. So, um, and then, yeah, so back to the whole thing, how this fits into the whole hierarchy. All types have an upper bound of any and, uh, and a lower bound of nothing. So uh, you can think of the Scala compiler automatically adding these things for you. Um, but yeah, so uh, you guys already know that. I, I'm sure if you're here. The whole point of showing you that was to say, well, Java kind of already does all that stuff too, except maybe with, type, with the type members thing. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, that's, that's more or less the same. What I want to try and show you with you know, this entire talk is that Scala gives you a lot, of, a lot more control over type checking in your programs than, 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 than just these, these few things, right? So. Um, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, this is where it gets interesting. So the first thing um, that I wanted to talk about, like I said in this whole list, was, was abstract type members. So a type member, uh, you can see it here in this class person. Uh, you have an, a, an abstract type member pet. Um, and I mean, it's just, it's a type where we don't really know what it is. Um, and it sounds pretty basic, but uh, the whole idea is that you, 
can sort of, in superclasses, leave these type parameters abstract and make them concrete in subclasses. So we can do that in this, this class Susan here. Class Susan extends person. Uh, and you can, you can make concrete this abstract type parameter. It's now a concrete type parameter, but our type member. Um, and we can make it a cat, right? Um, and sort of you can think of that actually as, as being the same as, as parameterization. So if I wanted to uh, do the same thing like you would do in a language, like just in, in, in Java or something, um, you would do something like this. You would pass pet as a, as a type parameter to person. Uh, what? Huh? That's supposed to be class. Wait, no. Yes. Okay. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, all right. Like, of course, person has to have to, have to take a type parameter. It has to be changed. I'm sorry. I totally forgot. So, uh, you can then take class Susan and extend uh, Susan with. Oh man, this is messed up. It's supposed to have it's supposed to have a cat. Wait, no. That's right. No, that's fine. That's fine. Oh my god. I guess that I'm a little frazzled today. Please and jet lag. Ah, okay, yes, so this is fine. So basically, my, my argument is that these two things are the same. Um, and, and actually, one thing that's kind of funny, I think this, I don't know the name of the paper. Uh, I, I saw it a little while ago. Martin wrote a paper with, like, I think it was Phil Wadler or somebody, about um, this, this sort of thing with type parameters and, and uh, abstract type members and things like that. And, okay, you know, how, what, 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 is, what is better, what is better, you know? And he found that they did some huge empirical study, actually. And they found that, um, of course, as, as the number of parameters increases, sort of the complexity sort of of your code ends up kind of exploding. And uh, you know, things are left tractable with, uh, with abstract type members instead of you know, making some huge thing that has 20,000 type parameters in it. Um, and it's really funny. It was like some, some, like, um, some paper that was at a very good conference in like, the 90s or something. It's quite, quite funny. So anyway, the point is that. Um, this, you'll find later that this, this, these, this, these abstract type members are, are pretty powerful because we'll, we'll, see that, we'll see that it's possible to, using them to subsume a, a lot of other sort of things in Scala's type system. Uh, so anyway, the takeaway that, that, uh, that I'd like you to walk away with about abstract type members is that you can, you can uh, still achieve the same level of abstraction without the verbosity of type parameters and having to keep track of where you're passing these things. Um, which leads me to actually existential types. Um, a lot of people I don't think know what existential, existential types are because they don't see them very often um, in, in a lot of you know day-to-day -day code. Um, but the idea is pretty simple behind them. Uh, the idea is that we want to be able to still compile some piece of code where we don't necessarily know what one of the component types of something is going to be. Um, so, uh, <coughs> so an, ex yeah, an existential type includes references to, to, it can have value members, but usually abstract types uh, that, we don't, that we know exist somewhere in our program, but we don't really know at the time when we write this one bit thing, what specifically T is going to be. So um, that's, that's sort of the intuitive idea. And, and sort of the, the key notion here is that you can leave some parts of your program unknown and still ch type check it and have diff different implementations for those, for those unknown parts. So this little code snippet here doesn't actually do anything. Um, it just illust I mean, you know, you, you might look at it and think, well, it, it doesn't make any sense because I have no idea, you know, I have no idea what, what T is. But this compiles and farm has, has, it doesn't have to know anything about, about fruit or anything else and it's all, it's all fine. You could pass, you know, something, like you could, or, or apple, whatever, which could be this T, and you can still pass that in, and, and, and it's, all, it's all fine. Um, and sort of the, 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 the takeaway here is that um, the thing that people like about existential types is that uh, you can fully decouple implementation details from types. Uh, and this is why people in ML and languages like ML, they like existential types very much. Um, so, on to the next construct in, in, in the type system that people like to talk about, uh, higher kind of types. So you have to, in order to understand what a higher kind of type is, you have to first know um, what a, a type constructor is. So a type constructor is, is, is here, in this, on the left-hand side here. Uh, this parameterized type that you see down here defines actually a type constructor, so Q of T is a type constructor. And it can be used to construct 
instances of lots of different things. So a queue of int, a queue of string, a queue of Q of int. Um, and a higher kind of type is one that abstracts over those, uh, over, over those things, those type constructors. Uh, and uh, so there are, you, you, know, you can have two different, two different forms of them in Scala. So this is, I think, most often people see form number one, where you just see it all together. Uh, C is a higher kind of type since it abstracts over the, the M type constructor, and it's kind of all in line. Uh, and another one is actually where you have a type constructor uh, defined as an abstract, uh, abstract <coughs> member. Uh, so here, D, in this case, is a higher kind of type since it abstracts over callback, which itself is uh, a type constructor. So really, the, the big idea behind higher kind of types here is that you can abstract over common abstractions. So you can abstract over things like container types. And if you've looked at the, uh, this, the, the Scala, like just the, the architecture of the Scala standard collection library, you'll see, you'll see a lot of this happening. Um, the, la the last sort of interesting <laughs> variety of types I'm going to talk about uh, are refinement types and structural types. Um, these things are different, um, but I'm going to really talk about refinement types right now. Uh, a refinement type refines something that already exists uh, by, by adding new members or doing something new to it. So, um, huh, actually, yeah. Um, uh, this is, is, I'm sorry, I told you I had this, this funny problem, and these are some old examples that I thought I had gotten rid of. So anyway, um, what? Okay, so they can be, I, I've, they can be structural, but the, I'm going to talk with just only about the last example here, um, where we have something uh, C, uh, which uh, has a field uh, age of type int, and we can actually refine that and create uh, and add an additional field to it by, by just doing it like this here, by making concrete this field and then uh, adding another field and calling it name. Um, the second, the, 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 the middle example here comes from, uh, comes from the, sc the Scala, or sort of d similar to what you might have seen if you ever read the Programming at Scala book by Martin. Um, yeah. So yeah, refined types can be used wherever a type can occur. They're not just for instantiating one-off types. So you can use them inline as well, is the point that I wanted to make there. Um, but yeah, so I guess the idea is that you can sort of have duct typing, uh, but totally, totally static rather than what they do in languages and other in dynamic languages. Yep, shoot. Sorry. I so is your example, uh, uh, what's the scope of the ability to, for somebody to be able to name? So in other words, you've got uh, x is equal to new, and then Well, that's just, this is, this, so this is a, a new, a totally new, a totally new type that gets defined. Right. So what are you asking? You're asking who can x, see? X Well, this is a stupid example. I mean, there, there's nothing <laughs> like this isn't this isn't meant to like you can't. I don't I don't intend for you to actually use this. This is just saying, hey, you can add a field to something. No, you can add a field, but it sounds like to me what you want to do is you want to use the type annotation. Yeah. Uh, because then you would get the refinement. Uh, yeah, that's 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 true. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry. This is again a side effect of of sort of a, a disaster that happened this morning, um, and and that's why this slide and that slide are in there. <laughs> I'm sorry, I tried to fix these before I, could got, I got here. But anyway, um, my goal was to give you some convincing examples of things that you could do in Scala that you couldn't do in a language like Java, where in Java you can think of the type system as giving you a way of enforcing different shapes uh, and, and you know, making sure different sets of shapes go into different interfaces. Uh, and it checks that you know thing that, that these different shapes are correct and that they're being passed around in the right way. So it's kind of like, like like this this childhood game where you know you want to put a square peg in a square hole, round peg in a round hole. Uh, 
But in Scala uh, has all of these other things, like these, th these, th these things like uh, higher kinds, which, like I said, they let you abstract over type constructors and all kinds of other things. So you can build abstractions on top of abstractions, and then you can uh, do all kinds of things with, with um, you know, uh, these type members, and you can uh, refine things, and you can make new types all over the place. Uh, and you can combine them to do all kinds of different things. And uh, as I'll show you in a minute, um, you can even do a lot of type level stuff that will transform some types to new types. Um, so, so I haven't quite gotten there, but just sort of some of these preliminaries, uh, ideally, uh, well, I'm trying to, tr trying to argue, m make Scala a little bit stronger of a language. It's more like having a, like one of these, these toys that are more reconfigurable. And clearly, oops, sorry. And clearly, a, like a transformer toy is more fun to play with than a brick in a box toy. <laughs> anyway, um, so some of the stuff that Scala enables, I can talk about a lot of things, um, but uh, I, I, you know, wanted to sort of prune it down to a few things that I think are, are pretty important. Uh, so everybody has heard of type classes. Most people know what they are by now. A couple of years ago, people didn't really seem to widely use them or understand them. But um, now they're more popular. I think it's not so hard to convince people that they're useful. Uh, type level programming is, is something that's been around for a while. And you know, generic programming and all of these things have been around for a little bit. Um, and I'm not so sure it's there that, you know, in, in, in a lot of communities, it's very well understood what that means specifically. Uh, and then there's uh, some stuff called materialization, or what Eugene and I like to call materialization, which is another, another form of kind of generic programming. And all of this is sort of type directed. Um, and so we, we, we sort of use the type system to do very rich things that, that enable like a lot of flexibility and, and eliminate boilerplate and all kinds of things. So the first thing I want to talk about um, are type classes. So what are they? Um, what are they for, I guess, if you don't know what they are? Uh, they allow retrofitting types with interfaces. So even something that, that is, is, is final and you can't change, you can add methods to it. Um, and in Haskell, they're actually built into the language. But in Scala, they're, they're a popular sort of type-based pattern, uh, which itself is based on, on uh, this notion of implicits. So just to give you a quick definition of what they are, uh, a type class is a generic trait. Um, so here we can use ordering. Uh, we have a, a, this is this actually an ordering in the standard library. This is just a dummy ordering. But uh, this is the type class for that. So this defines the actual interface. And you could have some method compare in it, um, which compares two things and gives you an int. Should probably give you the thing, but OK. Uh, so in a type class instance, which you can have, you, ha you can have one type class and many type class instances. A type class instance uh, is, is itself exists as, a, as an implicit, which provides an implementation for that interface, um, and it's an implicit so that sort of the wiring gets done automatically. Uh, so if you wanted to define uh, one that that um, uh, ordered integers, you could define it this way, where you have uh, some implicit object, and it extends your, your ordering type class. Uh, and then you implement you know, your, your compare method, however it means to have that implemented. Um, and that's sort of the shape. Um, so you can also have, um, you can also express constraints and, and, and you know, provide suitable implementations for those. Um, one way of doing that is uh, with this, this notion of, a, uh, of an evidence parameter. So you can basically require a certain type class uh, in something no like normal, like a, a, a sort method, um, and have this you know, more or less be completely invisible to the user. So uh, for example, if I have a, 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 se a, a sequence, I, I would like to know how to perhaps uh, you know, have some notion of ordering, maybe, in, any, you know, in whatever I do with it. Um, I'm sorry, I, I need a notion of ordering for, I'm sorry, implementation of sort. So in, in this example, uh, the ordering 
an, an instance of ordering for sequences. So imagine that there was one for sequences. Um, uh, uh, would be uh, implicitly found in scope, uh, and and used. It can be used in the implement in the in the concrete implementation of the sort method in any way. Um, so uh, this evidence parameter provides a, a concrete implementation of, of that type class for whatever the type is that you end up passing to to sort. Um, and and a short a shorthand way of doing it is by using what's called a context bound, which is kind of confusing because it's got a name and it's something else, but really it does the same exact thing as, as what we write up here, this implicit evidence ordering thing, just it gets rewritten, uh, like if you write you know, sort t colon ordering, it gets rewritten to this, this implicit evidence thing by the compiler. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the basic idea of type classes. So you can, you can uh, you know, use them as constraints and things that you implement, uh, and you can uh, and you can, yeah, so, uh, you can basically use, or you can also, well, yeah. Um, so the next thing that I think is pretty important and interesting is uh, this notion of type level programming. Uh, so the, the basic idea behind type level programming is that you do computation with types at compile time in the compiler. So given some input type, some, or some types, uh, at compilation time, you do some computation to have an output type. Um, and, and the way you do that is you take two steps. Uh, you define a type level function, which can take all kinds of forms and be all kinds of different things. Um, and then you need to apply that function during type checking. And I'll show you in, a, in an example in a second. Um, but yeah, in, in real life, there's a lightweight use of some type level computation in this can build from pattern in scholars collections. Um, so one, one common way, so if you want to create this, this type level function, um, one common way to do it is to uh, use implicits, which can be <coughs> implicit values or, or de uh, you know, implicit defs, all kinds of things. In the example I'm going to show you, it's going to be a bunch of implicit values. Uh, but you can use them for defining relationships between types. Um, and so here, here in this little example, I mean, again, this is a small example. The idea, the, the, my, my goal is just to give you intuition. Um, but in this example, the idea is that, uh, like, we have, we want to just figure out a mapping from, from country to city, uh, or capital city, rather. So um, our goal is to actually do this little, this very stupid little mapping computation at compile time. Um, but people might normally do this, you know, at runtime, right? Um, so here we have, so, so in, in this class has capital, has two, uh, two type parameters. Uh, one has to be a country, one has to be a city, as you can see. Uh, and uh, you can think of the, the, the type level function that we're trying to implement as, as you know, the, the, the input being the country and the output being the city. Um, and you know, we, in this case, have a bunch of implicit values that, uh, in scope that um, do this mapping for us, basically. And sort of the magic part uh, of it, I mean, this seems pretty straightforward, but the, the part that's actually kind of interesting is that in this this, uh, this def lookup capital method, um, this, this has, uh, this, 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 out, this, this return type here, C, uh, is calculated by the compiler. So that's gonna be the actual like value, uh, if you wanna call it a value, but that, like, that's what we want. That's what the compiler is gonna figure out for us. So, um, you know, you take a, as, as an implicit parameter, uh, has capital, which the, like, these things are floating around in scope, and if I provide, um, if I if I provide as a type, uh, the 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 country where I'd like to look up the capital. So in this case, uh, val c equals look up capital France right here. Um, it tells the compiler basically, uh, uh, you know, to, to it, it triggers look up, uh, it, it triggers implicit search and. Uh, and, and which itself is, is inter intertwined with type inference, and it figures out the, the return type to be uh, Paris. 
So um, it's, a, it's a small, stupid example, but I mean, if you want to think of it like your type is a value, uh, then this is a way to do some very trivial computation, but computation nonetheless um, at, at compi uh, compile time. <coughs> so the type checker calls our, our type level function and computes the, the capital of France. Oh, I, I guess I, what I didn't say, though, is the way that you should apply these things uh, is, well, by, by using uh, an implicit parameter, for example, in this case, to trigger this implicit, this implicit search, which is sort of the type level function. Um, so uh, type level computation uh, is used all over the place. Um, not super widespread, but used nonetheless. So as I mentioned, can build from is one example uh, where you know, at compile time, sometimes frustratingly, uh, the compiler tries to figure out what the best, the best result type of, like if you call some combinator on some collection, uh, tries to figure out what you should get back. Um, and it, you know, that's something that you could think of as being totally like a compile time type level thing, right? It's like doing computations at, at, com at compile time. Um, and then another, another use case uh, are phantom types, um, which uh, it, phantom types can be thought of as, as types that exist only at compile time. So they add additional checks, but they don't have a runtime representation themselves. And you can, uh, using this sort of type level approach, you can, you know, for example, make a list uh, or a collection or something and track the length of it at compile time. And one, one situation where this would be, could be useful is when you need to, to zip two lists together or two, two collections together and wanna make sure, you want to make sure, at, at compi you want to reject the code at compile time if, they don't have, if, if they're nonsensical and they have different lengths. So this is one example where you could use something like a phantom type. Um, so uh, the, the, my favorite uh, use case, sort of, or favorite thing about, about using types in a powerful way is, is uh, this, this notion of, of materialization. Um, Eugene likes materialization a lot as well. I know that for sure. Um, so materialization is, uh, is all about trying to get rid of boilerplate when you are defining type classes. So if you wanted to uh, have something be parameterized by a bunch of a bunch of different types. You have to basically write these type class instances for every type uh, that you're interested in uh, uh, having a type class instance for. So if I wanted an ordering of string or an ordering of something else, um, not all the time, but sometimes uh, you you know you have to just write all these different type class instances out. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, you can you can make uh, a generic function, or a uh, I'm sorry, uh, a, gen a generic implicit def return a type class for some range of types, and that can help by reducing boilerplate. But sometimes you, there's just no way to use a, an implicit uh, generic sort of function um, to, 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 to abstract over sort of the, 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 the tedium of writing type class instances. So uh, in those cases, uh, I mean, this is like, you know, for example, we can't. Uh, abstract over all possible types that a generic could take. And I mean, this is, uh, for example, in this serialization framework that, that uh, Eugene and uh, Philip Haller and I worked on, um, of course, there's no way to know every possible type that you are going to, uh, you know, need to generate serializers for. So uh, in these cases, uh, we use uh, a macros, actually, to, to help us. So. Um, we basically just combine uh, macros and, and implicits, um, you know, in order to prevent there from being a, a growing number of implicit vowels uh, that that define or impl implicit vowels that are basically your your type class instances. Um, and so, in, in the case of serialization, uh, you would make a uh, an implicit uh, an implicit uh, uh, def like this, Gen Pickler. Uh, which itself uh, is implemented by a macro, and the way the ma like the way you, you do materialization is this macro uh, inspects the type the type arguments. So in this case, it would inspect this this t thing. Does something that corresponds to sort of the logic of what it should do, uh, but you know evaluate to a type class instance. Uh, in the end, 
Um, and so that's sort of the, the intuition. I hope it's, hope it's pretty clear. Um, and then sort of like the last, last thing I wanted to sort of briefly uh, like hopscotch over is, uh, is dependent types. I don't know if anybody's heard of these things before in the world. Um, I'm not going to give you an academic treatment of them. I want, again, my, my goal is to try and be a little bit intuitive. Um, so I want to tell you first what dependent types are in general. Um, there's a lot of languages on the planet like Idris and, and uh, Agda and Koch and Epigram and uh, a bunch of things that are you know, fully dependently typed languages. Um, and, and you might have heard, okay, well, there are dependent types in Scala. Um, I mean, Miles Sabin does a lot with these dependent types. Um, what does that have to do with the other thing? And then also we have this notion of dot and dotty, which you might have heard of, which is Martin's new experimental compiler. Um, and dotty stands for, uh, dotty is a cute little nickname, which stands for uh, dot, which itself is an acronym for dependent object types. So these things all have the word dependent in them. Are they related? Actually, well, we'll see. So um, just to give you an idea of what a real dependent type is, a full spectrum dependent type, uh, the idea is that uh, types, well, actually, oh, oh I, lost a, I lost a transition. Um, so types depend on values. I had this big thing, so types depend on values. Uh, and, and what that means is that uh, in the type, you can include a, a logical proposition, uh, which says something about what the values of those types should take. Right? So um, it, it gets a little bit complicated because well, I'll, I'll show you. But a, a little example in a language called Koch is this here. Um, the goal of this little thing here is to define uh, a subset type, which is kind of like a refinement. Um, it's to, to do, so, so think of z as an integer. And we want to make a new kind of z. Uh, but we want to make uh, z star only apply for things that aren't zero. And z, pl and z plus is uh, things that are, are greater than zero. Um, so these, this thing here, this x greater than zero, is this logical proposition that you want to attach right, to the type that says something about the values that the, that the type can be represented in. It's kind of a simple like example. Um, another example that you might have heard of is being able to figure out at the type level whether or not you're going to call head on an empty list. These are things where values and types, we can try to intertwine them and, and sort of make programs that know a little bit more. It gets a little bit tricky, though, um, because this is all based on logic. Uh, and so values of types have to contain <coughs> proofs that these propositions are true. Um, but another example uh, is that of a, of a binary tree. Say we want to ensure that whenever we make an update to that tree, uh, we want to make sure that it's balanced. Um, and so with dependent types, you could, you know, we can do that by having some kind of logical property attached to the data type. Uh, and it could look something like this. But this is just, yeah. And that's, that, I mean, it's just another little example where they could, you could consider them useful. But there's a, a small caveat. It sounds really great. It sounds like you can um, you know, get rid of a lot of runtime errors by having dependent types, because you know, any boundary conditions or anything else, you can try to find a way to get rid of. Uh, however, because, uh, you know, so yeah, the idea is that you're mixing values and types, uh, at, but you need proofs about these properties as well. Um, which means that a, a dynamically typed or a dependently typed programming language uh, can also be should also be able to be used as some type of logic. So, um, in order and in order for logic to be consistent, we need to require we need all kinds of very interesting requirements. Like you know, um, programs have to be total. Uh, they can't crash, or they can't they can't ever or they can't allow non-termination, which in a real programming language is is not yes. Is there a reason? Yeah, so, so the, reason, the reason why is, is so, so I'm not quite sure like what you're asking. Um, so in order for 
so, e so everything is based on like logic and proofs, right? So uh, in order to prove anything, you, you have to generally, you know, not get in a, caught in a situation where stuff doesn't terminate, right? And so if people are using, uh, if, if people are using these programming languages to do the things that they do in them, they need to, they, they need that the programs not terminate because typically what they're doing is, uh, well, like I was going to say in the next slide, um, proving theorems. Uh, these languages are proving theorems. Um, so the, due to these caveats, uh, it's not really like, you know, you just, you just, it just will not compile. You cannot write something that doesn't terminate, basically. So um, these caveats, or, I'm sorry, do these caveats fully dependently typed languages have a tendency to be useful for theorem proving? And uh, that's popular in, in the world of verification where, um, uh, you know, you've got some closed world program and you want to just ensure that it's correct, make correctly making decisions. So, I mean, lot, there's a, a infinity research and verification on, of compilers and, and there's even this JS cert which certifies <laughs> a JavaScript interpreter. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that, that um, a subset, it's a subset. It also verified the specification and all these other things, but that's what these languages are used for. Um, because of these, these sort of um, aspects of their design, it makes it difficult to write a web server in them, right? You just can't, sorry. Um, so that brings me to Scala. Well, what the hell does that have to do with Scala? Actually, not very much. Um, because we have dependent types, but they're not the same kind. You can't just attach a, an arbitrary uh, um, proposition in logic to our types and, and do anything with them. I mean, these are all just based on paths, usually, right? Um, and you have these dependent uh, method types as well, uh, which you might have run into. And I'm running a little bit low on time, um, but this, I'm just going to give you the gist of this. Um, so you can use these dependent types to have a, a type safe key value store, um, where if you have, for example, in this, uh, this class, do I have a mouse? No. OK, um, in this class awesome DB, um, you have this valid data map where you, your key, you have a, a key value uh, a key a, a, and, and a value, and your value is represented as any. And you want to, you know, reject things at compile time if, if you know, you, you people are passing in the wrong wrong values. Sure. Uh, and basically, the idea is that you can use um, you can use sort of nesting of objects and these dependent types, these these dependent these these types that are are dependent on on this nesting and on these paths. To ensure that uh, you always, you know, you get compilation errors over, over a bunch of, you know, weird runtime errors. So um, the idea, uh, in a few seconds, is that um, if you, for example, uh, in this object keys, you want to create uh, a new key, a new key, with uh, where its value is a string or, or its value is an int, uh, you can do that. So we know statically that this should always be an int. Uh, and you can set it in this data store thing down here. Set keys dot foo uh, twenty three in your in your in your new DB thing, um, and you can get it. And it gives you more type information than just any. It knows that it's an int. Um, and of course, if you try to pass uh, a, you know a, a string to the thing where we know it should be an int, it doesn't compile. Um, so with a traditional key value store, you can in insert values of the wrong type. But path dependent types help us enforce that they type specified in each key always match the corresponding value. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, but these things are, are actually taken to some real level of utility in languages, I'm sorry, in libraries like uh, Miles, Shaven, uh, Miles Shaven's Shapeless Library. Um, and uh, yeah, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get to how this relates to Dottie. But um, basically, uh, Dottie is a research compiler which which um, experiments with these, with, with, uh, which it, it basically does projections to try and simplify Scala's type system by, um, by representing more things as like abstract types and stuff like that. You don't lose anything. You don't lose language features. You just end up finding ways to represent them with a, a, a smaller subset. Um, and, and, and dot, dependent object types, is, is actually just a calculus. Uh, and, and these things, like I said, have nothing to do with really uh, like Coq and, and Agda and these other languages. But I can stop there. Is Dottie open? 
Yes. But uh, you don't, it's just a type checker right now. It's no, there's no, you can't like compile anything into anything that you can use. You can, uh, if you, but there's, I don't even think you can pretty print trees that come out of it yet. Okay. Um, Martin has been working on it for a year now. <laughs> Uh, and he has successfully uh, compiled the Scala compiler and whatnot with it, and a number of things that are not trivial. Um, but he's, he's a type checker kind of guy. He's not a back-end person. So now we're trying to figure out how to reuse parts of the, the you know, pieces of the current Scala compiler's back-end to hook that up to Dottie and to see if we can you know, compile all the way through any arbitrary Scala program. It's on GitHub, yeah, but you just can't do anything with it. I mean, <laughs> you can, you can. Yep. So uh, structural typing has may, or I don't know what the current status is, have some performance impact. Yeah. If you, if you do that. Uh, can you talk to anything about the outlook of that, uh, and if any of these other uh, kind of, uh, aspects of the type system have any other kind of similar performance considerations? The only thing, the only thing in the, in the type system that that you know, incurs a cost is using an actual structural type because that makes these reflective calls, uh, which I, uh, I believe at least Daniel Spiewak at one point figured out how you could get rid of this reflective call. Um, but uh, otherwise, um, as far as I know, I don't. None of these other type, none of these other uh, uh, like type system constructs or features or whatever, they don't do anything else at compile time. It's all totally static. So you don't have to. I'm uh, sorry. Don't do anything else at runtime. It's all totally static. So I, 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 could, I don't think there are any other sort of type system performance things other than the compiler is slow, nothing at runtime. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, from a high level, how to, so you... Like, like, for, like if you're going to make an int order type class, mm -hmm. your, your implementation is just like, you know, I, I want greater than I do. Yeah, so, um, I, I can, uh, so, so I mean, I guess pickling is, is a pretty straightforward example in that, like, you have this pickle method, uh, which you want to have implemented, and you know that you want, you know, to take in some arbitrary type, and that you want to emit, uh, you know, an array of bytes, for example. So you have that much shape information. Um, and basically, you, you know, you want to be able to figure out how to serialize different instances or uh, different types of objects or whatever. So the macro itself would be kind of going around and, and traversing like this, this object and figuring out what it is and then figuring out how to, 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 to you know, implement the stuff in that type class instance. But the whole point is you should be able to pass any arbitrary type to it and then the macro does all of the sort of Static work of you know stuff that's not so simple, and and yeah, and then you can make that macro implicit, and then the, the pattern applies to code generation. Basically, is the observation. If it's if that's clear, I hope it's not clear. <laughs> okay, but uh, yeah, I think I think uh, we're over time. So okay. thanks. Thank you.